wonderful Jesus. We thank you for the righteous one. We thank you, Father God, for the one who has blessed us. Lord, we thank you for the one who has saved us. We thank you for Jesus. Lord, we come, Father God, realizing that you are good and you are God. There is no God like you. You are precious. You are awesome. You are amazing. God, we say hallowed to your name, for God, you're worthy of all the honor, all the praise, and all the glory. We come now, Father God, asking you to forgive us for our sins. Forgive us that we will hear from you, Father God, that your word will be made clear, that your word will be relevant, that your word, Father God, will be what we need in a time like these. Bless us tonight, Father God, that we will be a people of prayer that life, Father God, will continue to roll on and we can tell men, women, boys, and girls about the God we serve. Teach us your word, Father. In Jesus' name, amen and thank God. opportunity and another chance for to get it right with him. Amen. <laughs> we got another chance to get it right with God. I mean, God just keep giving us chances. Not a second chance, but most of us, or all of us, or I did, burned up my, my second chance a whole long time ago. So God has given us another chance and we're glad about it. Tonight we're looking at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. In the New Testament, the book is 1 Timothy chapters 2. We're looking at verses 1 through 4. We're in our month of prayer, so we're talking about prayer. Amen. Well, last week we talked about prayer. What did we learn or what did we rehash on last week? First of all, we mentioned the fact that when you look at Luke chapter 11 and Matthew chapter 6, you find the model prayer. It is the model prayer. It's not the Lord's prayer. Where is the Lord's prayer found? In Gethsemane. Okay, where is Gethsemane? Is it somewhere across town? Mm -hmm. So where is the Lord's prayer found? Where, where is it found? John 17, John 17, we find what is known as the Lord's Prayer. When we look at Luke chapter 11 and Matthew chapter 6, this is the model prayer where Jesus teaches his disciples how to pray. And we, we learn, or we rehashed, most of you already knew, uh, we, we found out or we reiterated that the, this model prayer sets a standard by which we ought to pray. And we ought to pray without ceasing. What does that mean? Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Continual prayer. Continual prayer. That's a good answer. Anybody else? Pray without ceasing. There's only 24 hours in a day, 24 point some hours in a day, right? So does it mean that we ought to spend our time 24 hours a day in prayer? No. We could. We could. I mean, uh, I have. I do. Okay. Amen. Bless the Lord. Anybody else? Anybody else spending 24 hours a day in prayer? So the Darrington got connection with God. If you need a prayer to get through, she can get it through. She's spending time with the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's a good thing. Amen. So we ought to pray without ceasing. We ought to pray in the good and the bad. We ought to pray continually, right? And so our attitude ought to be one of prayer. So we also discovered that um, Jesus wants us to continue to pray. We, we know he wants us to continue to knock. And if we knock, the door will be open. He wants us to seek. And if we seek, we will find. He wants us to ask. And if we ask, it will be given unto us, right? And so tonight, <clears throat> um, Paul writes to Timothy and he, he picks up this thing about prayer. Uh, 
uh, in my Bible it says that uh, I preached this on December 4th, 2022. And this is, and I, I focused on the one God and one mediator. So tonight in this same pericope, we're going to focus on prayer, okay? He says, therefore, I exhort you, first of all, that supplication, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men. He says, prayers, supplications, intercession, and giving of thanks, or thanksgiving, be made for all men. Be made for all men, everybody. Then in verse 2, he goes on and lists some other groups of men. But he says that these things should be made for all men. So Timothy, in the book of Timothy, which is Paul's writing, he says, I exhort you. I encourage you. I ask of you. I implore you. Whatever you do, have prayer. And he, he starts off with saying supplication. Now, this is no particular order, in my view, because he lists prayers, secondly. And we know that supplication is a part of prayer, right? And so he says, whatever you do, you ought to pray. God's house ought to be the house of prayer. Jesus kicked those out that was exchanging in the synagogue he kicked them out of the synagogue and said, this shall be called the house of prayer. This location ought to be known as a praying location. Your house ought to be known as a house of prayer. But certainly when you come to the house of the Lord, it ought to be known as a place where prayers are going on. Are prayers going on in this place? Is enough prayer going on in this place? Can we do better with prayer? Yes. Should we do better with prayer? Yes. If we're going to have a New Year resolution, we ought to make a New Year's resolution centered around prayer. Prayer makes us more intimately in touch with God. Prayer brings us in tune with God. And we ought to pray individually and we ought to pray corporately. We ought to pray as a group. And we ought not pro call prayer time only when there's a disaster. Almost every church opens up when a hurricane hits and we run to the altar for prayer. We run to the altar for prayer when disaster takes place, when issues have, have arisen, we rushed in for prayer. There's nothing wrong with it. We ought to pray when there's a disaster. We ought to pray when somebody's hurting. We ought to pray when we have a need. But we ought to have a lifestyle of prayer. You ought to be known as a prayer warrior because Prayer takes you into the line of fight, the line of fire. Yes, yes. Prayer takes you right into the storm. I mean, into the storm of all the stuff that's going on around us. Most of you have seen the, the, the movie War Room, and it's a war going on. And, and we ought, ought to enter into our war room. Jesus says, go into our closet, shut the door. And bless the Lord in the closet, pray to God in the closet, pray to God in private, and then he will reward you openly. Thank you. We ought to have prayer time. We ought to have some time where we pray. I'm afraid that if we called a prayer meeting, people would be missing. I'm afraid that if we call a meeting to, to just do nothing on Sunday morning but pray. People say, oh, I ain't going down there. For 18 years, we've been having Wednesday night prayer throughout the whole month of January, for 18 years. And there is 
that one neglected factor in his prayer. God has called us to pray. And when you pray, you're just communicating to God. You're not communicating to the people. You know, back home, they could really bow down and call on him. And when those deacons back home prayed, it, it seemed like there was nobody in the room but them and God. They were talking to him. And they would start off by saying, this is for no shape, form, or fashion. For no outside show. And when they prayed, you knew they were sincere about prayer. They were real about prayer. And they trusted that God would answer their prayers. We ought to pray. We ought to call on God. We ought to, we ought to have a prayer time together. We ought to have a prayer time individually. We ought to be able to go around the room and everybody pray. Because you're not talking to people when you pray, right? I hear some people when they pray, they stop talking to God and start talking to people. I mean, they just start talking to folks. I mean, in the middle of their prayer, in the middle of talking to God, they stop and start talking to people. Roy, God said it's going to be all right. Then go back to talking to God. Prayer is communication with God. God talking to you, you talking to God. And when you pray out loud, Jesus says, don't be like the hypocrite. Don't, because they think that they have holiness because of their much repetition. Just call on God in prayer. Just talk to God. Just lay it out there like you're talking to your friend. But make sure you reverence him. He's not the man upstairs. He's not the big boss man. He's not the dude in charge. He is the one who is holy. We ought to talk to him in prayer. And we ought to talk to him like we know he's the one that answers prayer. We have to talk to him like we know that God is the one who answers prayer. Let me tell you, when you have a prayer life, sometimes you will get in trouble and you won't have time to pray. You steady? <laughs> I didn't have time to pray. <laughs> lifetime. A, a, a lifetime of prayer will put you in situations where you know God is there. You know the only thing I was wondering, where am I going to stop sliding? I, I didn't think about Jesus have mercy. I didn't think about cars running over me. I'm just like, bike stayed back there. And I'm just going down the road. I mean, I'm just, I'm just going down the road. After was over, I said, Lord, thank you. So somewhere, I should have had prayers on layaway. I ought to have a relationship with God so much so until God knows what I need when I need it. Let me tell you, God knew when I needed it. When I needed it. At that one moment. God knew what I needed. I mean, I got up and everything aching. And that was within the first, the first half mile. So Dave said, a normal person would have just gone back home. But I was trying to demonstrate to members of the New Beginning Church, when you're determined, you can make things happen. So we, we have to understand that prayer is supplication. Supplication is asking God to do it for you. Supplication is a request from God. And supplication is a deep down agonizing prayer life. Lord, I am going to ask you the word, the root word here is supply. I'm going to ask you, Lord, to supply my needs. And the God we serve not only supply our needs, he gives us what we want, doesn't he? We just can't pray amiss to pray for ourselves and, and, and omit God. We are here to glorify God. We are here for the purpose 
of glorifying God. We are here that everything we do, everything we say would glorify God. So our prayer life is the same. God, how can I glorify you? Now, Lord, I want you to give it to me. Lord, give it to me. Let me have it. I want it, Lord. I know I can do without it, Lord, but I want it. Anybody ever prayed like that before? Many times we pray like this. Lord, I can't do without this. You got to get. We sound like a drug addict. I got to have it. I got to have it right now. Let me have it. I got to have it right now. But be honest with God and say, God, I want it, and this is why I want it, and Lord, I will glorify you with it. And remember now, God knows what you will do when you get it. So the word supplication means to supply, to give. Paul says in the living that God will supply all my need according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. King James says all my need Whatever God, that one need that you have, God supplies it. The Apostle Paul is talking about those who would give to him in his ministry. And God supplied that one need to him. And God, he's able to bless other people and glorify God through it. So when we pray, we ought to supplicate. We ought to, we ought to ask God for supplies. We ought to agonize in our prayer. The Bible said Jesus prayed into sweat drop like Great drop, drops of blood. Have you ever been to that point? Have you, have you ever just prayed and talked to God? Now, I'm not talking about talking to God till you fall asleep because you, you're tired. I'm talking about talking to God until you fall asleep because you have been worn out in prayer. A lot of us have prayed. I'm, I'm guilty. A lot of us have gotten on our knees and prayed and fell, fell asleep and woke up 20 minutes later and, and tried to pick up what we left off. And it wasn't because I had spent so much time with God. It's because I was tired when I got down there from something else, not because of wrestling with God. The second thing the Apostle Paul mentions here is prayers. We ought to offer up prayers. We ought to communicate with him on a regular basis. The third thing he says, intercession. It means that you ought to lift somebody else in prayer. You ought to intercede and intervene. This word intercession means to intervene for somebody else. Here lately, God has shown us a, 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 an opportunity and many folk who hadn't prayed in a long time intervene for the Marham. God put before us, you know, everything that happened, God allows it to happen. God put before us, while many people were watching, millions of people were watching, God put before us a need for prayer. And players and coaches and non-athletes and people that usually don't watch the game, bow down somewhere in prayer. And then the report comes that he's doing better. Now the report comes that, that he's breathing 50%. Now the report comes that, that he's off the ventilator. Now the report comes that he's back home. And we want to believe that our prayers got through. Let me just tell somebody tonight. Our prayer should not be extended only to the Mount Hammond. Our prayers ought to be extended to the person next to us, the person that lives next to us, the person that works with us, the person we live with, we ought to pray. And Sister David would say, I, I spent much time in prayer for her, and then I spent much time in prayer for me. Because when somebody goes through a trauma, the whole family goes through it. It's a devil thing, a devil say thing. So you can't be selfish where you just pray for you, your stuff, and your family. You got to pray. It says, intercede for others. Pray for the bereaved. Pray for the bow down. Pray for the one that's in need. And you ought to pray honestly for those who are in need, just as if you're praying for yourself. Paul says, I exhort you, I, I encourage you that whatever you do, 
supplicate, prayer, pray, and then you intercede. Finally, he says that you ought to give thanks. You ought to have some gratitude about what God does. You ought, to, you ought to love God so much until you tell God what you want. You ought to have thanksgiving to God and it ought to be a gratitude. It's not like God thank you. Sometimes we pray over our food and it's like a ritual. Lord, thank you for this food. Bless in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank God. And we run through it as fast as we can. And some people, when they pray over their food, they act like something in their eyebrows. They start rubbing their heads and dropping their faces. And don't want people to see them. Let me tell you something. Every knee going to bow. And every tongue is going to confess to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Every knee is going to bow. You either bow now or bow later. It's just the bottom line. It's just, it's just the fact that you ought to pray with thanksgiving. Lord, and we thank him even though he didn't give us everything we want. How many people in the room got everything they prayed for? Anybody? How many people in the room got 50% of what they prayed for? How many people have got nothing that they prayed for? If you have not received anything that you prayed for, then your prayers are very limited. You need to be praying for somebody else. You need to be praying for supplies, petitions. You need to be communicating with God. You need a, a prayer of thanksgiving. You need to make sure that you spend time with God. You can tell me you love me all day, but if you don't spend time with me, you don't love me. We talk to God and tell God, God, we love you. We praise you. We magnify you, Lord. You are the great God. You are the great king. And we ought to pray that way. But do we exemplify what we pray? So he says, with thanksgiving for all men. Now, listen to what he says. Supplicate. Pray honestly for all men. Have prayers, communicate with God for all men. Intercede, intervene for all men. And give God thanks. Now that's the one that trips us up. Give God thanks for all men. Giving of thanksgiving be made for all men. You thank person, you thank God for your enemies. I had this, this great time and fellowship coming down the road from Conoco Phillips and Sweeney one day. That was a fellow that would always give me trouble. I mean, he would just cook up something. I mean, he, he cooked up something one day until my hair almost grew back. He just cooked up stuff. And I was driving down that long stretch coming from Sweeney, Texas, and I just began to pray, Lord, bless him in the name of Jesus. God bless his family. Bless his children. God bless him with a pay increase. God bless him with a promotion. Lord God, bless him, Father God. Bless his attitude. And finally, I said, Lord, that he will be saved. That was the hardest thing I ever done. Because I thought about other things to do. Just said, Lord, bless him. We have to intercede and intervene for folk that we don't even like. He says all men, right? He says everybody. So we ought to intercede for all men. And then he said, verse 2, for kings, and all who are in, th in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all goodness and reverence. reverence. So look at what he says. We want to play for those in authority. Has it been hard in the last eight years to pray for those in authority? Has it been hard for anybody? 
Am I the only one that found it hard? From, 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 from 2015 to 2020, it was just hard to pray for, for the king. For, for the president. But we had to pray. And guess what? The only thing that kept this world spinning on its axis is somebody somewhere was praying. Praying for the kings. Praying for those in authority. You pray for your pastor. Yeah. You pray for your Sunday school teachers. You pray for your leaders. You got to pray for those in authority. You pray for your CEO. You pray for your supervisor, your boss, your manager. Pray for those in authority. And guess what the reward is? He says it right here. He says, the reward is that we might lead a quiet and peaceful life in all goodness, in all relevance. Reverence. In all reverence. He, he says that we ought to pray for these people who have charge over us so that we will make sure that we have a peaceful and a quiet life. Word quiet is tranquil life. When I think about a tranquil life, I think about water flowing and you're just hearing that water flowing and you don't have a word a worry in the world. It's just a quiet, peaceful life. Anybody in this room just got a quiet life? I mean a life with no drama. I mean just without drama, hallelujah, thank you, God. If you're married, and you don't have any drama, you ought to throw up both hands and say hallelujah. Every time you think about your spouse, God, thank you. If you have a friend, a boyfriend, girlfriend, a, a brother, a friend, or any kind, when you think about them and there's no drama, you know, just say, Lord, thank you. God, I appreciate you. And then when you have a friend, a spouse, or an associate that, that like you, you say you don't want any drama. He or she says she doesn't want any drama. You ought to throw up both hands, two feet, and jump high. I said, Lord, thank you. Because there are some people, even grown people, that's got drama in their lives. He says, you ought to pray. You ought to pray. You ought to pray. You ought to pray. You ought to even pray before you make a choice, before you make a decision. You ought to pray before you read the word and before you uh, listen to the word. Lord, I'm going to read your word now. God, I'm going to listen to your word. Make your word clear to me. Lord, speak to me by way of your word. Lord, bless your word to fall on good soil in my heart. God, bless me to be receptive of your word. Lord, bless your word to go forth and make a difference in my life. Lord, as I sit here and I listen to your word, I want to hear from you, Lord. Then when you finish hearing the word, finish reading the word, Lord, thank you for your word. And Lord, your word says, now you give God back his words. Especially when you're about to ask for something, you got to give God back his word. When the devil came up to Jesus and he said, now look, I know you're hungry. You haven't eaten for 40 days. Now, here go some stones. You turn these stones into bread. First of all, the devil won't tip you until you're weak. And he won't tip you in an area except the area where you're weak. And that area that Jesus was weak in is that he was hungry. And he was human, right? So you try not eating in 40 days. My, my, my. Somebody would say, bread, come for them. <laughs> Jesus says, God, this is the word of God. Everything that comes out the, uh, the word, the mouth of God is what we all live by. He says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by God's word. Every word that flows from the mouth of God. He was hungry. He was being tempted. The stones were there. He had the power to turn the stones into bread. But he used God's word. 
when we pray, we ought to pray God's word. We ought to pray over God's word as we read it, as we listen to it before we start. We ought to pray over God's word. Then we ought to pray God's word. The reason why people don't pray God's word is because they don't know God's word. We got enough Bible, many of us, to be dangerous. To come up with some idea. But when we know God's word and we challenged on it and we still praying over it and we still present it back to God, speak to God what God has spoken. When you hear your child and your child is repeating what you have said, you get joy out of that because number one, they connected. Because children are not going to tell you they're hearing you. They're not going to let you know you're right. We had what was called a form in our house. Megan was a teenager. I guess she started dating around 17. We had the form. And so before anybody, whether it's an adult that she's going on vacation with or a friend to visit a friend house or a boy coming to pick her up, they were presented with the form. And Brother Miles, the form for some people was a page and a half and then for others, that we knew was one page. And on the form, it says, I am taking Megan Davis away from her house at this time. We will arrive at our location at this time. This is way before GPS, right? We will, we will, we will stay there until this time, and then I will have her back and back at home at this time. Now, what I did was I always filled in the time back home. Are you with me? So one night, a little boy comes over, and, and, and she's already prepped him. You know, Daddy got this form. You're going to have to fill out, right? So he, he comes in the door, and I knew his family from church, and, and he was a nice-mannered boy. And uh, I slid the form over to him, and she was all dressed up and dolled up, getting ready to come down the stairs. And he said, man, you serious, aren't you? I said, 300 times. And so, and so he said, man, it ain't that serious. I just turned around and said, Megan, he said, you ain't going. <laughs> and he realized, maybe I need to do this. Because on the form, it had the license plate number. It had both his parents' cell phone number. And it had arrival, departure, and back home. And I always feel that the back home. So what I'm saying to you is, God wants us accountable to him in prayer. Everybody you deal with ought to be accountable to God. And your associates that you deal with ought to be praying associates. Let me tell you a secret. Even gangsters want praying women for their wives. Have you noticed that? Gangsters want women of the church for their wives. That's why church folk always ask the question, what does she want with him? It's because he knows that somebody will intercede for him. He wants somebody that will pray for him. Because he knows he's living a trifling life. He wants somebody that will be praying for him. So, so it says, you need to live a quiet life. Reverend life. You want to live a life that's honorable before God. And that life comes through prayer. It, it comes through spending time alone with the Lord. It comes through talking to the Lord in public and talking to the Lord in private. It is corporate prayer and individual prayer. And you can live a quiet, peaceful life. I mean, a peaceful life. You can drive in some neighborhood and you can tell this neighborhood is not a quiet neighborhood. And if you're going to buy a house and you ride through the neighborhood, wait till Saturday night and a Friday night to ride through. And you can tell if it's quiet and peaceful. Because it is giving glory to God. Verse number three. For this is good. But this is acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. Prayer, 
along with a quiet and peaceful life is a good thing. Now let me tell you, you don't have to wait till you get old to want a quiet and peaceful life. If you don't want any drama, stay with the Lord. And let me tell you, most of us in this room, well, I dare say all of us in this room, we too old for drama. Mm-mm. Too old for that kind of shenanigan. I mean, man, my nerve too bad for that. I mean, just drama. Some people, when you see them coming, they're drunk. And it's all about them. And if you don't pay attention to me, oh, I'm going to kick on the floor, I'm going to lay down, kick like a dying roach, and you're going to have to pay me some attention. You know how children do it in grocery stores, right? Dad would say, wherever you fall out, that's where I'm going to fall out. So I didn't have that privilege. So there are some people who just thrive off a of drama. They go get jobs, and they leave the job because there ain't enough drama there. When you have a quality prayer life, you can have a drama-free prayer life. Anybody want a drama-free life? Anybody wants to have no drama? I mean, we got all kinds of drama going on. Male, female drama. Female, female drama. Male, male drama. Baby mama drama. We got all kinds of drama going on. But we have to learn to live a quiet Life that gives God the glory. Because when we give God the glory, we're doing what we're born to do. We're doing, we're doing what we're made to do. And that life comes through prayer. Because let me tell you, even if you are a Christian, even if you are born again, and you're not a drama type person, drama will find you. You need to pray before the drama gets to your address. Because drama's going to find you. Somebody's going to cook up some drama on you. Drama knows how to find you. Drama knows how to get to you. I told you before, a guy, he, he, was, he, he was always getting sick. And he always got on everybody's nerves. So one day we didn't want to deal with him. So we set up a plan. John, you sure don't look good today. And I walk on. Next guy comes in. John, you, you sure are looking pale today. He just walked past him. Next guy comes in and says, John, are you all right? By noon, John is gone. We got peace. No more drama. But when you have a prayer life, drama can come and you can still deal with it. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. It's because you got a prayer life that deals with it. And what you do when you have a constant prayer life is that you take the drama and put prayer on the drama and let your big brother handle it. He knows how to handle it. Final point he makes here tonight. Verse number three, he says, for it's good and it's acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. He's talking about God, the Savior, Jesus Christ, all one. In verse 4 he says, Who desires that all men be saved and come to the knowledge and truth. And he stops. God desires that all men be saved. Jesus wants all men to be saved. God has positioned us so we can pray that all men are saved. We ought to be praying for those. Let me tell you, if we were actively praying, if the church was actively praying, crime would decrease. Child abuse would be no more if the church would just pray. God says, if my people, the people that are called by my name, if my people, the people who honor me, if my people would just pray. If we would just honestly pray. I mean, when 9-11 hit, we couldn't get in any church that night. I mean, everybody crying out to the Lord. 
Everybody is just pouring their heart out. I mean, the church wasn't that packed on, on Sunday, but I think it was on a Tuesday. It was jam-packed. We have to get to a point where prayer is not an escape for us. It's not a fire escape. It is not a refuge. It is a lifestyle. Lord have mercy. Lord bless us. Lord, uh, Lord, we thank you. Lord, we glorify you. Lord, supply us. Lord, I just want to talk to you. When he talks about prayers, we just ought to have time where we just talk to God. And let me tell you, things will come up during the day that give you a reason to talk to him. You can't fuss it out. You can't cuss it out. You got to pray it out. You just have to talk to God about it. He says, this is good. This is acceptable in the sight of God. God, the God, the Savior, the one who desires that all men are saved. The church ought to have the same desire that God has. And that all men will come to the knowledge of the truth. We ought to desire that men are saved. We ought to desire that children are saved. We ought to have a goal to reach souls for Christ. We ought to be adamant about reaching souls. We ought to be enthusiastic about bringing men to Christ. And of course, we can't bring them unless the Holy Spirit draws them, but we ought to be out there beating through the bushes, walking through the through the corridors, making sure that we introduce people to this Jesus Christ we know. And most of all, we need to pray for lost souls. We need to call on God. God bless souls to come to you. God bless us to be the catalyst to, to find souls for you. God use our hearts, use our bodies, Use our minds, use our voices, use our feet and our arms to exemplify you so men, women, boys, and girls can come to know Jesus Christ. We ought to be in prayer. Our church ought to be a praying church. A lady that used to go to church here, she left and went to another church and she had cancer and, she, and she, we prayed and prayed her through two bouts of cancer. The third time she got cancer, she wasn't a member here, and she came back and she stood before the church and said, this is the church that prayed me through the last two times. I came back to this church so this church can pray me through the third time. This church ought to be known for our prayer life. We ought not be known for mass. We ought not be known for robotics. We ought not be known for music. We ought not be known for public speaking. We ought to be known as the house of prayer. If you want some prayer, you get it over there. It is the house of prayer. It is God's house. And one of the things we're praying for is that souls be turned to Jesus. Yeah, we want to pack the church out. Yeah, we want a lot of members but above all, we want to build the kingdom. And the only way to build the kingdom is that souls come to Christ. We want somebody to confess Christ because the Bible says it is God's desire that every man, every woman, every girl, every boy gets to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. God's desire is that no one be left out, no one left behind. All men will be saved. I hope tonight that put a burning in your heart. God, use me. That ought to be everybody's New Year's resolution. Lord, use me to draw souls to Christ. And to come to the knowledge of the truth. Jesus is truth. He says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the light. In the 21st century, we we're confused about what truth is. Sometimes we think truth is the wrong thing or the right thing. We have lived a life in the 21st century and in the 20th century where wrong began to look like right. But Jesus is truth. He has not changed. He's the same as he was yesterday. He's going to be the same in the future. 
He is truth. This word truth means the facts. This word truth means reality. This word truth means reliability. We can rely on Jesus to be the same. The same Jesus that got up, we can rely on him to be the same. He wants every person to get to know him, and we ought to be praying that people will come to the knowledge. Because when they come to the knowledge of truth, that simply means they come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. We got to get Jesus in people. When people have Jesus in them, they, they at least stop and think about it. When people have Jesus in them, at least they will give it a second notion before they say it or do it. When people have Jesus in them, even if they're not fully com converted and turned around yet, they will at least have the Holy Spirit to say, oh, don't do that. It's our responsibility. Pray, Lord, send some souls. The harvest is plenteous. The labors are, tr are, are few. But check this out. The ones who are laborers ought to be about laboring. If we are called to labor, we ought to be laboring. Question. Would you like it if you hired somebody to come to work and you got a deadline to meet and that person knows you have a deadline and every time you turn the corner, you see them jumping up off the ground, or jumping up out of the chair and running back to get the job done. How would you feel about that? Anybody? How would you feel you're paying a person by the hour, by the minute? And every time you turn the corner, they see you coming, you jump up. They jump up and start back to work. But we'd like, like that? You wouldn't like that? So, Brown, would you like that? How much more should we be laboring in the vineyard, putting our selfishness aside? And reaching souls to Jesus. God doesn't want us to go to sleep at the wheel. And check this out. God gives us. He gives us 20 years. 30 years. 50 years. 18 years. 12 years. He gives us 70 years. 80 years. Some people got died 90 and 100 years old. God gives us these years. And if we would just labor these years. These years are nothing compared to eternity. We will be rewarded from now on if we just pray and labor. If we just get excited about Jesus, excited about souls and pray, God send somebody. Next time you go to lunch or to dinner, or go to a restaurant, and the waiter is waiting on you or the waitress, ask the question, how can I pray for you? Nine out of 10 times, they will let you pray for them. Eight out of 10 times, they're going through a hardship and they will break down crying right there on the spot. Seven out of 10 times, it has been my experience that they received Jesus Christ right there at work. And you have to prep them for it. Now, you don't need to close your eyes. You don't need to bow down on your knees. I want you to keep this job. But what I want you to do is invite Christ into your life. And I begin to tell the story. Jesus died on Calvary. He died for you. If no one else in this world existed but you, Jesus would have died for you. He died, he was buried, he rose, and he was seen, and he wants to make your life better. And he wants to make your life fruitful, even in the future. How can I pray for you? Next time you're a mechanic working on your car, and you're sitting in the waiting room, and, and people in there, just ask them, how can I pray for you? Now, you can't be stuck on yourself and do this. You can't worry about how you're going to look and do this. But just remember this. God wants every man and woman to be saved. Every child to be born again. And he wants to use you as a catalyst. And it, all it takes is prayer. Because you know what? Your co-worker that, that doesn't go to church, sooner or later tragedy is going to hit. And they don't want to know, will you pray for me? Will you be more concerned about your image? How I look, how I sound. Or will you be more concerned about salvation?
He says, we want people to be brought to the knowledge of truth. Why should we win souls? Why should we pray for people? Because number one, we have been commanded to. Number two, we get great joy out of Jesus turning a person's life around. Number three, we are to do it simply because we want somebody to go to heaven other than us. <laughs> we ought to do it in order that God will be glorified. We ought to win souls, and we do it through prayer. There may be maybe somebody listening tonight who never received Jesus. Jesus died for you. He was buried for you. And he rose for you. And he wants to be a part of your life. He wants to come into your life and make you a new person. You bow your head with me right now and invite Christ into your life. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. But come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul in Jesus' name. Amen and thank God. We believe that you're now born again. We believe that, that you're on your way to heaven. And, and we believe that you are a part of the body of faith. If you need a church home, I recommend the New Beginning Church where Jesus is the captain, where Jesus is the center of attention and the main attraction. If you receive Jesus Christ here tonight, inbox us and let us know so we can rejoice with you. You want to be a part of a good Christian church in Boston and let us know. And we will welcome you to this family of faith. You can be a local member or a global member. We'd be glad to have you. At this time, we're going to move to our prayer for salvation. Oh, Heavenly Father, we come to say we praise and worship your holy name. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for who you are. We, we thank you for all that you have done for us. And on tonight, Heavenly Father, as we focus on salvation and evangelism, Heavenly Father, and soul winning, we thank you for loving us so much, Heavenly Father, that you sent your Son, Jesus, to die for our sins. He died and he was buried and he rose from the dead with all power in his hand. And we became saved, Heavenly Father, saved from our sins, Heavenly Father. Lord, that we can have eternal life with you. You did that for us through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we say thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for, for saving our souls. Heavenly Father, as we learned and discussed on tonight, you have a desire that all men should be saved. Lord, the ones that we love, the ones that we might not like, the ones that we don't even know, Heavenly Father, you desire that all of them should be saved. And so, Heavenly Father, we, we ask that you would that you would save them, Heavenly Father, all those who would be receptive, that you would save their souls. But we also understand, Heavenly Father, that the main way that you accomplish that is through, is through us. And so we ask on tonight, Heavenly Father, for those of us at the New Beginning Church, Heavenly Father, Lord, that you would set aside our, our fears, that you would Set aside our doubts, Heavenly Father. Set aside things that don't really matter. And help us, Heavenly Father, to go out and to spread the good news of Jesus Christ so that men can be saved. Whatever means that is, Heavenly Father, be it 
Facebook Live or text messages or going out and talking to our coworkers, to our families, our friends, strangers on the corner, Lord Heavenly Father. Give us, Lord, the boldness that we need to go out and tell people about Jesus Christ that they may be saved, Lord Heavenly Father. Give us, Lord Heavenly Father, the spirit of evangelism. Give us, Lord Heavenly Father, the mind to accomplish what you have said in your word tonight. Give us what's needed, Lord Heavenly Father, that we may be the vessel in which you use to tell others about the Lord Jesus Christ. So we thank you, Heavenly Father, not just for ourselves, not just what you have done for us through salvation, but what you can and what you will do through us, Heavenly Father, in reaching lost souls. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your great mercy. We thank you for your great love. Lord, we thank you that tonight we don't have to worry about going to a burning hell when we die. We thank you, Heavenly Father. Bless us here, Heavenly Father, at the New Beginning Church. Lord, bless Christians and saints all across this world. Lord, that we all may be about the business of telling others about the Lord Jesus. We thank you tonight, Heavenly Father. We praise your holy name. Continue to be with us. Continue to guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, sir. God has, has tremendously blessed us in the middle of, of these times, and we thank him. So continue in prayer. Remember to supplicate. Ask him for your supplies. Remember to pray, communicate with him on a regular basis. Remember whatever you do, remember to intercede for others, and intervene for others in prayer. And finally, whatever you do, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. Do it in prayer. And as you read, as you study, as you listen to the word of God, pray over the word of God and pray the word of God that God will continue to bless his word. The ultimate goal is that souls will be saved. and We will fall in right fellowship with him. And I'm going to tell you, thieves will have to stop stealing if they're saved. Robbers will have to stop robbing if they're saved. Life would mean something to people if they're just saved. It is now oftentimes time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. If you need an envelope, please raise your hand. You'll be served. Sister Hughes will bring it to you. If you if you raise your hand, you will you will be served. Those of you who want to give electronically, those of you who want to give electronically, you can give by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com is our Zelle account. That's lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. If you want to mail in your gift, you can do so by mailing it to P.O. Box 503. Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That is P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Let us stand and be dismissed.
Father, we thank you for this privilege of talking to you. We thank you for these words. We thank you, Father God, for your word. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless us as we go, that your word will go with us, go before us, and lead us. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, unto him be power, glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us sing together. We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering the world, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. You are dismissed.